queens of Europe. Elizabeth I. Part 2. Elizabeth I outlived her younger brother and managed to keep her head during the Protestant persecution of her sister, Queen Mary, to ascend to the throne at the age of 25. The wise and politically astute young queen faced immediate pressure to select a powerful husband, but rather than hand power over to a man, she declared that she would not marry and instead remain a virgin all of her days. But Elizabeth may not have been as chaste as she professed to be. Her master of horse and personal bodyguard was a dashing and swarthy courtier by the name of Robert Dudley. Elizabeth and Dudley had been acquainted since childhood. They bonded while they were both being held under threat of death in the Tower of London years earlier. Dudley's father was one of the men who had schemed to put Lady Jane Grey on the throne, and following her downfall, he was beheaded and his family imprisoned. Now Queen Elizabeth kept Dudley close, and rumors of an affair between them sparked scandal. But Dudley was already married. His wife Amy lived away from court and was reported to be gravely ill. It was whispered that Dudley was waiting for her to die so that he could marry the Queen. And die she did, not from illness, but from a fall down the stairs. The suspicious nature of her death led many to suspect that Dudley had orchestrated her murder. Though the inquest ruled that Amy's death had been accidental, Elizabeth had no choice but to banish her favorite from court. Three years into her reign, Elizabeth contracted smallpox and fell into a coma. The nation dreaded that the queen would die without an heir and England would fall into anarchy. She recovered but was left with pock marks on her once flawless fair complexion. To preserve her beauty, she took to wearing fine white makeup called Venetian ceruse, which contained lead, a toxic element that slowly poisoned her for the rest of her life. This near miss brought back the pressure on the queen to marry and bear children. But Elizabeth had another idea. Her cousin, Mary Queen of Scots, had recently returned home after the death of her first husband, King Francis II of France. Elizabeth proposed a husband for Mary, her old favorite, Robert Dudley, and suggested that their children could be heirs to both kingdoms. But Mary resented being offered the English Queen's cast-offs and refused to entertain the idea. Instead, she fell for and married the dashingly handsome Henry Darnley, who turned out to be a foolish, arrogant, and violent man. In a jealous rage, he murdered Mary's secretary in front of her while Mary was pregnant. Another Scottish lord, James Bothwell, orchestrated Darnley's death by blowing up his bedroom. Mary was then abducted by and forced to marry Bothwell, and everyone suspected that she'd been involved in her previous husband's murder. The Scots rose up against their queen and forced her to abdicate in favor of her one-year-old son, James, whom she never saw again. She fled to England in the hopes of finding sanctuary, but was instead arrested and imprisoned. Love and lust had been Mary's downfall, and now Elizabeth's resistance to both seemed a very wise decision indeed. For years, Mary continued to be a figurehead for Catholic resistance in England. Rebels rose up in the north and attempted to free Mary and place her on the throne, but Elizabeth's army defeated them and hundreds of rebels were hanged for treason. The Pope declared that any Catholic who killed the English Queen would be innocent of sin and would secure a place in heaven. Several assassination attempts on Elizabeth's life were foiled by her secret service. Across the Channel in France, thousands of Protestants were murdered by their Catholic neighbors during what became known as St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. France fell into religious civil war. Tensions between English Protestants and Catholics were once again at a boiling point. And one particular Catholic and ex-suitor would come back to haunt Elizabeth. King Philip II's Spanish Empire controlled large portions of Europe, including the Netherlands, which happened to be England's biggest trade partner. The people of the Netherlands decided they'd had enough of living under the brutality of Spanish rule, and rebellion broke out. Their leader, Prince William of Orange, asked Elizabeth for support, 
She couldn't be seen to openly promote an uprising against a monarch, but she secretly sent money to bolster the campaign. She also considered backing someone who might be able to ride in and take over the Netherlands for her. Francois, Duke of Anjou, was the youngest son of Catherine de' Medici and brother of King Henri III of France. He was 24 to Elizabeth's 46, but he began to send her very steamy letters with the undercurrent of arranging a mutually advantageous marriage. The queen was on the rebound as her old standby, Robert Dudley, had given up hope on her and had gotten married in secret and without her blessing. When Elizabeth learned of the betrayal, she flew into a rage and banished Dudley's new wife from court. Anjou arrived in England to continue his seduction, and he and Elizabeth hit it off immediately. She was smitten with a charming young man she called the Frog. She tentatively considered marriage and was optimistic for a happy union and even children. But public opinion was against the foreign match, and a xenophobic pamphlet was circulated condemning the foreign prince. Elizabeth was infuriated and ordered that the pamphlet's writer have his hand cut off. But she knew that she couldn't go against the people's wishes, so with a heavy heart, she turned Anjou down. She did lend him financial support in his attempt to take over the Netherlands, but he bungled the operation, returned to France in disgrace, and died of malaria at the age of 29. Elizabeth supported another clandestine attack on the Spanish. She backed privateer Francis Drake, who besieged richly laden Spanish ships on the high seas and stole their cargo. He returned to England with the equivalent of a year's parliamentary revenue in gold and silver and was knighted by the queen on the deck of his ship. Elizabeth had always resisted war. Unlike the medieval kings who came before her, she recognized that the cost of combat on her treasury and on the very people was not worth the personal glory it would buy her. And as a woman, she was unable to march into battle and therefore had to rely on men who might not carry out her orders. But Prince William of Orange, Elizabeth's last Protestant ally against King Philip, was killed by a Catholic assassin, and Elizabeth had no choice but to send English troops, commanded by Robert Dudley, to the continent. The Queen's old favorite proved to be a poor choice for General. The English and Dutch were defeated, and now only the Channel stood between England and the might of the Spanish army. Meanwhile, yet another Catholic plot to assassinate Elizabeth was foiled, and this time it was discovered that Mary Queen of Scots, now imprisoned for 18 years, was directly involved. As long as Mary lived, she would be a threat to Elizabeth, but the English Queen had a horror of killing her cousin and a fellow monarch. She vacillated for days, citing death warrants, then canceling them. Finally, her ministers went ahead with the execution order, and Mary, the former Queen of Scots, was beheaded while wearing a crimson gown the color of Catholic martyrs. Mary's execution was just the excuse Philip of Spain needed to send his powerful armada to attack England. Philip thought it would be a simple campaign, sail up the Thames to London, remove the heretical queen, and claim England for his own. And while his navy was twice the size of Elizabeth's, his ships were large and bulky, built for long trade journeys to the Americas rather than tight battles. Elizabeth's fleet was faster and more maneuverable. She gave a stirring speech to her troops, proclaiming that, though I have the body of a weak and feeble woman, I have the heart and stomach of a king, and urging them on to victory. Rather than face the massive armada head-on, Sir Francis Drake, now Vice Admiral, turned the battle to his advantage by assaulting the Spanish in small dogfights and with fire ships, loaded with fuel and pitch, set alight and adrift among the Spanish vessels. In panic, the armada scattered and many fled. In a final battle, the English cannons won out and the Spanish armada turned and ran. Many of the remaining Spanish ships were wrecked in bad weather as they tried to find their way home. The defeat of the Armada was Elizabeth's finest hour. Any doubts about her ability to lead the nation as well as a man were forgotten, and she was acclaimed as nothing short of a goddess. 
With peace and stability secure, Elizabeth's reign became a golden era for England. Trade flourished, particularly wool, the nation's largest export, and her people grew wealthier than ever before. Art and literature blossomed. William Shakespeare wrote such timeless plays as Romeo and Juliet, Hamlet, and Macbeth. Elizabeth sponsored Walter Raleigh's establishment of an English colony in North America, which he named Virginia in his queen's honor. Raleigh introduced the North American crop of tobacco to the English court, and pipe smoking became all the rage, though he likely didn't introduce the potato as he has long been credited with. The queen dressed fabulously as befitted her glory and near mythical status. Now in her late 50s, the white lead makeup she'd been wearing since her bout with smallpox at 29 had done serious damage to her skin, which caused her to pile on even more of the acrid concoction. It had also caused the loss of most of her hair, and a lifetime of rich sugary foods had made her teeth turn black and fall out. As a distraction from her visage, she relied even more on elaborate gowns, massive collars, and ornately decorated red wigs. The young social climbers at court flattered and flirted with the aging sovereign all the more to gain her favor. But her lifelong friend and the closest thing she ever had to a husband, Robert Dudley, died at 56. Elizabeth was distraught and locked herself in her room for several days. Her most trusted advisor, William Cecil, who had been by her side since her ascension, also fell ill, and Elizabeth herself nursed him and fed him with a spoon. But he died as well, and Elizabeth felt increasingly abandoned and alone in her court of young upstarts. She liked continuity and replaced her two lost advisors with their sons, but they were no substitutions for their fathers. Dudley's stepson, Robert Devereux, Earl of Essex, was hungry for military glory, and Spain was once again preparing for a fight. Essex led a decisive, preemptive strike, destroying much of the invasion force that was waiting in the Spanish port city of Cadiz. He returned to England in glory, and his popularity began to eclipse that of the Queen's. He threw his weight around at court, and when Elizabeth denied his request to fund a further assault on the Spanish, he tried to muster public support against the queen's wishes. Elizabeth and her hot-headed lieutenant argued, and the queen boxed his ears. He responded by half-drawing his sword on her, an act of treason punishable by death. Realizing his grave error, Essex fled to his country estate in the hopes that the queen's temper would cool. Meanwhile in Ireland, rebels supported by Spain rose up against English rule and Elizabeth faced the worst military defeat of her reign. She sent Essex to put down the rebellion and regain her favor, but he defied her orders and delayed his attack. His incompetence infuriated the queen and she wrote him asking what was going on. He abandoned the army, sailed back to England and burst in on Elizabeth in her bedchamber to plead his case but she was not impressed. Essex was interrogated and placed under house arrest. Incensed at his disgrace, he hatched a rebellion plot to remove the queen and become Lord Protector of England. He gathered a private army and marched through the streets of London, calling for the people to rise up against Elizabeth. But few joined his doomed crusade and the Royal Guard easily defeated the rebels. Essex was tried and beheaded. Meanwhile, William Cecil's son, Robert, was secretly riding to King James VI, the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, offering his support in making James Elizabeth's heir and the next King of England. The Virgin Queen had never named a successor, though James, her closest male relative and a Protestant, was the obvious candidate. Elizabeth was now 69 and her health was in decline. She was suffering from ulcers in her throat, fever, years of lead poisoning from her makeup, and possibly cancer. For two weeks, she sat on a cushion on the floor, and though her counselors begged her, she refused to eat or go to bed. Finally, she asked her attendants to help her up, but she then remained standing with her finger in her mouth and her eyes fixed to the ground for a further 15 hours. At last, she allowed her ladies to help her into bed, where she fell into a deep sleep 
and never woke up. Courtiers rushed north to inform King James VI of Scotland that he was now King James I of England as well, and the island of Britain was finally united under one ruler. Elizabeth's 45-year reign took England from an island on the outskirts to a major European power. She facilitated a golden age of peace and prosperity for her people, and is thus justly remembered as one of the greatest rulers in England's history. A special thank you goes to my patron, Alexandra. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, comment your thoughts, and check out my other royal history videos. If you really want to help, please consider supporting me on Patreon. A link is in the description. Thank you for watching.